Thank you. All right, yeah, it's 11 a.m. I'm here in Toronto, 6 p.m. in Israel. I want to welcome everybody on behalf of Torah Motion, a pleasure to welcome back Rabbi Dr. Dr. Marty Lakshin for another, we look forward, we're sure will be a wonderful series, uh, Pshat, Rush, and Halakha, the interaction and interplay between them and the differences. And uh, it's a pleasure. Dr. Lakshin, of course, spent many years as a professor. He's a native of Toronto, spent many years as a, a, a professor at York University, where he is today the university professor emeritus, uh, received the PhD at Brandeis University, and of course, is the world expert on on Rashbam and uh, on many Parshanim and many, many Parshanim. It's really, I want, I want to thank you for all your uh, you know, your kindness and all the teaching you do for us. It's really a pleasure to have you and we're looking forward to the series and uh, Vakashat, Vakashat, Dr. Lakshin. Uh, thank you very much, Rabbi Kelman. Thank you for organizing this and thank you to so many uh, old friends of mine and uh, colleagues of mine who I see, uh, who I see here. I'm, uh, I'm honored that, uh, that you've come. The, uh, the method that we do here is that uh, I teach for 50 minutes and then I stop and you can send in comments through the chat uh, during those 50 minutes, but I'm not gonna look at them until, uh, uh, until the last 10 minutes and then we'll have, uh, uh, I'll deal with the comments in the last 10 minutes. As Rabbi Kelman said, the this series will be talking about the interplay of uh, Pshat, Midrash and Halakha. So halakha, the, the theory behind halakha, of course, is that halakha is Jewish law that is derived ultimately from the Torah. And the process of deriving the halakha from the Torah is the process of midrash. Midrash is the way of reading the Torah and the interpretation that we give to the Torah. And the result of it, uh, using what is called midrash halakha, midrash that forms or reveals, or some might say creates halacha. Either way you understand it, there is this connection between the biblical text and halacha. However, at a particular point in history, people started becoming interested in pshat, in the Jewish scholars started to become interested in pshat, in the plain meaning of the biblical text, even when there is a tension between the plain meaning of the biblical text and what the Midrash says and what Halakha says. And our series will be dealing with, each week we will take one topic, one issue, and show how different commentators dealt with this tension that sometimes exists between what the words seem to say and what the halakha is, what Jewish law is on a specific subject. And the, the subject that we're gonna be dealing with today is the uh, rather simple question that we all think that we know the answer to. And we probably do know the answer to it, but of course, I'll make it a little more complicated. Uh, what is a Jewish day? When does the Jewish day begin? And when does the Jewish day end? And those of us who had you know, Jewish education from the time that we were uh, little children, we, we all were taught that a Jewish day begins in the evening and then uh, finishes in the next evening. You know, to actually try to find this point in the Mishnah and in the Talmud and in uh, old classical rabbinic texts, as somebody saying, a Jewish day begins at night and ends the next night. It's not all that easy. We will, we'll start today, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start today with one text where actually we do see an attempt to uh, define what a day is. And it's in dealing with a, uh, not one of your more popular verses in the Bible, uh, but an ox, I'll read it in English. Those of you who can read the Hebrew can read the Hebrew. When an ox or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall stay seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day on, it shall be acceptable as an offering by fire to the Lord. You're not allowed to make a korban, to make a sacrifice from an animal during the first week of its life. That's the verse 27 in Vayikra in Leviticus 22. And then verse 28 says, however, no animal from the herd or from the flock shall be slaughtered 
on the same day with its young. Now, actually, if you look at the Hebrew, the shor ose oto ve'et beno, oto kind of means, seems to mean on the, this is not the Pshat Midrash issue that I really wish to deal with today, but I'll just mention in passing. Oto seems to be referring to the father animal, but as anybody knows, we, we don't very often, paternity is not all that easy to establish when you're dealing with animals. So, so if you have a, uh, if you have a, a baby calf, uh, you will know if you're if you've got a farm, you will know who the mother cow is, but you might not know who the father is. But anyways, Halacha says that even though it says here Oto et Beno, it's actually referring to Ota et Bena. It's actually referring to the uh, the mother and her young. And it says that you're not allowed to slaughter them on the same day. And so the Mishnah in order to, uh, to uh, explain this law and to say, uh, well, when is it that I'm not allowed, to, if I've slaughtered one of them, how long do I have to wait to, in order to slaughter the other one? So the Mishnah reads, One day that is written in the prohibition against slaughtering an animal itself and its young refers to a day following night. In other words, at nighttime, the day begins, and at nighttime, uh, you know, when it gets dark, when three stars come out, we, uh, the, uh, the halakhic literature usually uh, puts it that way, from the time the three stars come out one day until the next day, that's the, that's the definition of a day. So, in theory, if I slaughter an animal at uh, a quarter, 15 minutes before sunset, if I wait another hour, I can slaughter the uh, the young, because that's not the same day. That the definition of the same day is hayom uh, holech achar halayla. That the day follows night. The, the this halachic day begins at nighttime and it continues in the daylight. Etzo darash Rabbi Shimon ben Zoma ne'emar b'maase b'reshit yom echad v'ne'emar b'oto v'et b'no yom echad ma yom echad ha'amur b'maase b'reshit ha'yom holech achar halayla af yom echad ha'amur b'oto v'et b'no ha'yom holech achar halayla. So Rabbi Shimon ben Zoma taught in the Mishnah. How do we know this? This is his, the midrash that he's given. How, how do we know that the the definition of a day when it comes to slaughtering the mother and its young? How do we know that the definition is from sunset to one day till sunset the next day? Because they use in that verse, in that biblical verse, they use that that phrase Yom Echad one day, and that we all know that that phrase, Yom Echad, also appears in the story of creation. And just as in the story of creation, when it says uh, Yom Echad, it means a day that begins at in the evening and continues till, till the next evening, that's the same day that we use and how do we know uh, that it, that is the definition in the story of creation in Genesis chapter one? Well, the, the Gemara kind of expands on this and uh, on this Mishnah, and it says, "Et zot arash Rabbi Shimon ben Zoma lefi shekola inyan kulo eno medaber ella bekodashim uvekodashim laila holecha har hayom yachol af zekin neamar kan yom echad neamar b'masei breshit yom echad ma yom echad amur b'masei breshit hayom holecha har laila af yom echad amur b'oto ve'peno hayom holecha har laila." So Rabbi Shimon ben Zoma tells us, actually, if you look back here at the verses. Verse 27 is dealing with rules of sacrifices. And now the Gemara is telling us that when it comes to sacrifices, actually the day for a sacrifice, if it says that the meat of a sacrifice has to be eaten on the same day then, that the sacrifice was offered, that, it, that means when it, in rules of sacrifices, the day finishes when the sun comes up in the morning. You're allowed to eat the sacrificial meat 
during the day that the sacrifice was offered, and you're allowed to eat it until the next morning. So I would think that since verse 27 here is talking about sacrifices, even though verse 28 isn't talking about sacrifices, maybe they're using the same definition of day that we use when it comes to sacrifices. He says, no, because the phrase there is yom echad, and we know that the phrase yom echad appears in Genesis chapter one, and in Genesis chapter one, yom echad means uh, it means a day that begins in the evening and ends the following evening. So that's the same rule here. So this is in, in a kind of aside comment. We have the Gemara telling us that a day of creation began in the evening and ended in the evening. And Rashi in his commentary, which you see in the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, Rashi in his commentary says, Ma'aseb Reshit, like, how do we know that in the story of creation, the day begins in the evening and finishes the, the following evening? Because it says, Vayehi Erev, Vayehi Boker, Baresha Erev, Bahadar Boker. Because it is written there, there was evening and there was morning one day. First evening is written, and then morning is written. And this is, you know, I, I remember learning this, but I was in, I think, first grade or second grade, that that is the meaning of Vayihi era, Vayihi Boker. There was evening and there was morning. That's how we know that a day of creation was a day that began in the evening and then it continued until the next evening. Um, so here's, here's the source for this, uh, this claim of the Talmud that that is uh, how we learned to define a Jewish day. And uh, I, you know, I think from the time I was six, seven years old, I just assumed that this was uh, uh, obvious. And a, I, I always assumed that actually, it's a very good interpretation of the biblical text as Rashi says here, first evening and then morning. Baresha uh, Erev, Bahadar Boker. But then when I grow up, grew up, I discovered the Torah commentary of Rashi's grandson, uh, Rashbam, Rabbi Samuel Ben Meir, and saw the totally surprising comment that he has about this verse, by he era, by he boker. So first of all, let's just look at the context in Genesis 1. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. Vayhi erev, vayhi boker, yom echad. And there was evening, and there was morning, a first day, or one day. Here's Rashbam's commentary on this verse. Uh, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the, the history of this, uh, this comment. Uh, Rashbam's commentary on the Torah was almost, uh, was almost lost. Uh, Rashbam lived in the 12th century. You find people in the 13th, 14th, and a little bit in the 15th century quoting him. But then like in the 16th and the 17th century, it, it, it's like it dropped off the face of the earth. And then there was a rabbi who found a manuscript of it right at the end of the 17th century and then published it in the beginning of the 18th century. And that's why we have Rushbaum's commentary on the Torah. However, the manuscript that he found, he said when he found this manuscript that it was eaten at both ends by rodents. And because of that, we're missing the beginning and the end of his commentary on the Torah, uh, including the the commentary on Genesis chapter one. But then in the 19th century, someone else found a manuscript with Rashbam's commentary on Genesis chapter one. And there is a theory, I don't think the theory is true. You know, the, the, the guy who found that manuscript, that manuscript, uh, of, of that larger manuscript of Rashbam's commentary got lost during the Shoah, so we can't actually 
examine it now, but the guy who found it said that the beginning and the end were missing because rodents had eaten this manuscript that was being kept in an attic in a shul in, uh, in Germany and he found it there. The, the people knew that he was a bibliophile and they invited him there to come and look at the manuscripts that were there and that's how he found this manuscript. There was a theory for a while that censors had cut away the beginning of the uh, of Rosh Bam's commentary on the Torah because of the controversial comment that we're going to read right now. I don't think that that is true. I think that it just got lost because because of the rodents and not because of uh, of the censors. So here's what Rosh Bam writes: Vahi era, vahi voker, ain ktiv kan, vahi laila, vahi yom. He said, wait, "Wait a second. It doesn't say there was night and then there was day." Ella, Vayehi Erev, Sheheri Yom Rishon, Vishika Haor, Vayehi Boker, Bokro Shel Laila, Sha'ala Amuda Shahar. Rashbam is treating us like we're like we're idiots and explaining to us these words, you know, like like you would be explaining to a small child. He's like, look at these words here. What do the words say here? Erev and Boker. What does Erev mean? Erev means that the, the light of the first day subsided and darkness fell. Uh, here, where I am in uh, Jerusalem, it's going to be Erev uh, in about an hour's time. The sun is going to set about an hour from now, and then it'll be Erev. Some people say that Erev, the, the root, Ayin Resh Bed, means mixture. It's like, it's like that mixture of light and dark that, you're, that, that we're going to have here in Jerusalem uh, in, in, in an hour or so around sunset time. And then he says, and then it says, by he boker, what does boker mean? He quotes a Talmudic phrase, bokrosha laila. It's like the dawn that comes at the end of the night, she'ala amuda shachar. So Rashbam says, this verse that says, by he era, by he boker means, and it was 7.30 p.m. And then it was 6 a.m. Yom Echad. Hare Hushlam, he continues the uh, second last section on this slide. Hare Hushlam, Yom Echad min ashisha yamim, shamar ha kadosh baruchu ba aseret ha dibrot, ba akarka chitchil yom sheni, ba yom Elohim yehi rakia. At that point, one day of those six described in the Decalogue was completed. And then the second day began when God said, let there be a rakia, let there be an expanse. So according to Rashbam, this verse is saying that the day finished in the morning. And that that's what it means here. When you look at the text here, God created, and then you know, pardon the anthropomorphic uh, language here. God, like a human being, uh, creates during daytime hours. And then it was evening. And then it was morning, and that's the end of the first unit. And then when morning comes, that's when the second unit begins. And so the, 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 the day begins, that, that, that's what Genesis chapter one is saying, that God created in units of time, each one of which finished in the boker, finished in the morning, not that it finished at sunset of the next day, but it finished when the sun came up on the next day. And I think we all know that that's what I think all of us on a certain psychological level believe about days so that uh, if, if I go to a uh, wedding here in Israel two hours from now, I know that in the ketubah they will write b'chamishi b'shabbat. They'll say that it's Thursday because halacha says that two hours from now here in Israel is going to be Thursday because it, it'll be after uh, after nightfall. Uh, but if somebody asked me at that wedding, uh, what day is it today? I'd say it's Wednesday, even though I know that halachically it's Thursday. And if I am awake after midnight tonight, and uh, my wife asked me, what day is it today? I'll say Wednesday, even though, you know, the, the law of Canada and the United States and Israel says that after midnight, it becomes, uh, it, it, it becomes a new day. Uh, I, I think that all, all of us psychologically feel that a new day begins in the morning. And when I used to teach this text many years ago, I used to cite what the best-selling 
magazine in North America, the best-selling weekly magazine in North America, which was when I began my teaching career, the best-selling uh, ma magazine was TV Guide. And TV Guide would always give you Wednesday's listings that would finish at six o'clock in the morning on the next day. That's when Wednesday finishes. And so, so you know, from many perspectives, uh, we think of the day as finishing in the morning. And Rashbam's amazing new reading of this text here is that that's what the Torah is saying. Days were when it came to creation. He goes on. This text has no interest in teaching that an evening and a morning regularly constitute one day. You know, that, like that's what Rashi said back there. Uh, first there was evening, there was morning. That's how we know that a Jewish day goes from sunset to the next sunset. Rashbam says that, that's not what the text is trying to do. The text is interest only in describing how those six days were constituted. That when the night finished and the dawn broke, one day was completed and the second day began. So it says it very clearly, when the night finished and the dawn broke, that's the, that, that's the turning point from day one to day two, uh, that on the chat level, uh, you know, the first time I read this comment, uh, I don't know, uh, 40 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, I, I can't remember the first time, I, I was shocked. And then, then the more I thought about it, it made perfect sense on the shock level that that is what the text is saying, that a Jewish, that, that, that a day of creation finished in the morning, God creates, and then by here, by poker, when there's poker, that's the end of Yom Echad, and then the, the second day is going to begin at that point, at the point of poker. Um, Rashbam was a great rabbi. He was one of the Tosafists, one of the Balea Tosafot. He was uh, very loyal to Halacha. He was not interested in any religious rebellion. He makes it very clear Within his commentary on Genesis chapter one, when you get to the verse, when God is creating the sun and the moon and the stars, and it says that the sun and the moon and the stars will be they, they'll, be, they'll serve as signs for set times, for days, and for years. Rashbam explains how do the stars uh, 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 serve as signs for us. Rashbam writes, from the time that, uh, that uh, the stars come out until the next time that the stars come out, that's the definition of one halachic day. So Rashbam accepts that that's one halachic day, but he just does not accept the exegesis. He does not accept the interpretation. He does not accept the claim that that is the simple meaning of the words here, by he era, by he boke. He says, no, no, it's, it, this is telling us that a day of creation actually finished in the morning. And how do we know that a halachic day uh, begins in the evening and ends in the evening? Well, Possibly because we have other sources on the subject in the Torah. For example, it says about Yom Kippur, Me erev ad erev tishpetu shabbatchem. You should observe Yom Kippur from evening until the next evening. About Pesach, it says that you should refrain from eating uh, uh, leaven, uh, from eating chametz from the 14th of Nisan in the evening till the 21st of Nisan in the evening. So there are other texts that say that halacha teaches us that, uh, that halacha teaches us that a Jewish day, a halachic day begins in the evening, but that's not the meaning of this verse. So ultimately, is this so radical? I'm not so sure that it's so radical. However, it was seen by various other commentators as being very radical. It was also seen in the 21st century as being very radical. When Art School recently uh, started publishing an edition of the Mikra Otgarolo, the, compen the compendium, the traditional compendium of commentaries, uh, they put in their first volume, they put in Rashbam's commentary on Genesis chapter one, except for the commentary on this verse. They left it out. 
the commentary on Vayhi Era, Vayhi Boker, Yom Echad, uh, they censored uh, Rashbam's comment. And they weren't the first. I argue that the first who took on Rashbam on this subject was Abraham Ibn Ezra. Abraham Ibn Ezra was a younger contemporary of, uh, of Rashbam. He was also a commentator who was very interested in the plain meaning of the biblical text. However, his understanding of Pshat and Rashbam's understanding of Pshat were not always the same as each other. Towards the end of, of Ibn Ezra's uh, life, uh, Ibn Ezra wrote, a work called Igerat HaShabbat, the epistle of the Shabbat, the letter of the Shabbat. And it's, a, uh, it's an amazing piece of, uh, of literature uh, written in very fancy language. Uh, in the year 4919, which is 1159, actually I looked up last night, it's in the last days of uh, 1158, uh, at midnight on Friday night, the 14th of Tevet, this is gonna be of significance in the continuation of Ibn Ezra's text here, that it's uh, the middle of the Hebrew month. In other words, there's a full moon. Uh, the moon is going to play a role in the continuation of this text. I, Abraham the Spaniard, was in one of the cities of the island that is called the corner of the world. Maybe somebody uh, over there has figured out what is the city that is called Kitsei Haaretz, the corner of the world. But, uh, one of the cities in the place that is called the corner of the world. Corner of the world is Angleterre or England. Uh, that, that's where Ibn Ezra lived uh, towards the end of, uh, of his life. In, the, in his last years, he lived in England. I was asleep, it was pleasant sleep. I saw in my dream, standing in front of me, a vision that looked like a man holding a sealed letter. He said to me, take this letter that was sent to you by Shabbat. Shabbat has sent you, you have mail. The messenger said to, uh, to Ibn Ezra, take this letter. Here's the letter that the Shabbat has written to you. Uh, maybe just to save time, I'll read mostly in English, but those of you who can follow the Hebrew will see that the Hebrew is just filled with allusions to biblical texts. It's a really beautiful Hebrew that he's writing. And I bowed low in homage to the Lord and I blessed the Lord who had given us the Sabbath for having bestowed this honor on me. I held it in my two hands and my hands were dripping with myrrh. I read it. At first, it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I read the last few lines of poetry, my mind was in a rage and my soul almost departed from my body. I liked the letter until I got to the end of the letter. I was really enjoying reading it until I got to the end and then I was uh, in a rage and I almost died from the anger that I felt. One time, a number of years ago, I was teaching this text and one of my daughters was uh, present and she said to me, uh, Abba, was even Ezra a drama queen? Uh, and uh, I, I, I said, yes, it does seem that even Ezra is a little bit of a drama queen here. He's, uh, yes, I, I uh, the letter made me feel good until I got to the end of the letter. I asked this messenger who was standing there, what is my sin? What is my transgression? Why is, why did I get a, a, a nasty uh, email? Why did I get a nasty letter from Shabbat? Why has Shabbat sent me a nasty letter? From the time that I learned about our great God who created us, and from the time that I learned of his commandments, I have always loved Shabbat. I have always greeted her enthusiastically. I always, uh, I also always send her off joyous, joyfully with song 
when she departs, singing Zmirot, singing songs at Havdalah time. Who among all her subjects is as loyal as I am? Why did she send me this letter? That's what he asks. And then the Shaliach, the emissary of the Sabbath answer, Vayan Vayomer Eli. Notice the use of biblical Hebrew here. Even Ezra doesn't usually write in biblical Hebrew. Vayan Vayomer Eli Tzir HaShabbat. The emissary of the Shabbat said, Ugeid Hugad La Et Asher Heviu Talmidecha Et Mol El Beitcha Svarim Perushe HaTorah Vesham Katuv Lechalel Et Leel HaShabbat why did the Shabbat send uh, him this letter? The emissary said, she, she, the Shabbat, was told that yesterday your disciples brought to your house a Torah commentary. And there it says to desecrate the Sabbath evening. So gird your loins for the honor of the Sabbath. Go fight the battle of the Torah against the enemies of the Sabbath. Show deference to no man. As we shall see in the continuation, Ibn Ezra does not make it clear who the author of this commentary that, that came into his house that he is uh, learning from the emissary of the Shabbat, that it's a non-kosher uh, commentary on the Torah. He doesn't identify uh, the author of the commentary. And there was a, a suggestion in some scholarly literature on the subject, there appears to be evidence that in Cyprus, in the 12th century, there were some Jews who observed Shabbat from the morning until the next morning. And so in theory, it's possible, we, we don't have any record of anything written by this group. We just have a description. Some, some traveler said, you know, I, I came across this group of Jews and that's what they do uh, here. And so with the, the, even as we're sitting there in England, we get a copy of a Torah commentary that was written that we don't know anything about and that was written in Cyprus. You know, it can't be ruled out, but I think that the, the strongest evidence for me, that Ibn Ezra is upset with Rashbam and with Rashbam's Torah commentary is those last four words here in Hebrew, the last five words in English. The lo tisa pene ish, show deference to no man. This implies that the author of the Torah commentary that he is taking a pot shot at here is somebody to whom deference is often shown. And, and Rashbam definitely was a person who received a lot of deference. He was considered a great Torah scholar, a great, uh, a, a great Talmud Chacham. But the emissary of Shabbat told me, even Ezra said, even though this guy is someone who generally receives honor, don't you give any honor to him because, uh, because he wrote a dangerous book. And even as uh, goes on with his dramatic uh, description still in uh, biblical Hebrew, Ba'ikatz, I woke up. Ba'tikpa'im ruchi alai, and I was very agitated. Ba'nafshi nivhalam od. A line from the book of Psalms. Uh, you can go through this whole thing and you know find it's all snippets of biblical verses that Ibn Ezra puts together with his great skill in putting together a text made up of biblical verses. My anger was burning inside me. I got dressed, I washed my hands, I took the books out into the moonlight. Didn't have any light on in his, uh, in his home. We went outside into the moonlight and saw an interpret that an interpretation of the phrase, and there was evening and there was morning was written there. It stated that when the morning of the second day began, that was the completion of one full day of creation, precisely what Rashbam said. And 
as I said, uh, Ibn Ezra is a younger contemporary of, uh, of Rashbam, who was born uh, 10 or 15 years after, uh, after Rashbam was born. Uh, Ibn Ezra dates this text to 1159. Most scholars say that Rashbam's commentary on the Torah was written in the 1140s. And so now a copy of it has showed up in England uh, uh, 15 years after it was written. And even as for students, bought him a present. You know, they, uh, they, they, they brought this into his home and then he reports this dream. I, I think we can all say that this report of a dream is probably a fiction. This is Ibn Ezra probably discovered this passage in, in, in here uh, on, uh, on his own. And also in a, the text itself, he says that it's a dream. Uh, and, and so, but he's using this dream as a way of attacking Rashbam's commentary on the Torah. I almost tore my clothes. And I almost tore up that Torah commentary. Remember, it's Shabbat. You don't tear your clothes and you don't uh, tear, a, uh, tear up a book on Shabbat. But I thought maybe it's permissible. It's a Talmudic line. Why is it permissible to save somebody's life if they are sick on Shabbat? Why are you allowed to desecrate Shabbat in order to save somebody's life? You desecrate Shabbat to save a life, and then it ends up that the Shabbat gains because there's somebody who's able to uh, observe Shabbat in future, uh, in future Shabbatot. And so, so I, I thought that maybe it might even be permissible for me to tear this up on Shabbat because that, that, that will lead to more, it, it's true that's desecration of Shabbat, but that will, it will make sure that there isn't more desecration of Shabbat in the future. Imiru zeha perush hara, if people see this terrible commentary. Also, if people read this comment, then the uncircumcised ones, we're, we will turn into a laughing stock in the eyes of the uncircumcised ones. Now, of course, who are the uncircumcised ones in Ibn Ezra's world? They are the Christians. Uh, Ibn Ezra lived uh, some parts of his life in Muslim countries and some parts of his life in Christian countries. Both, both the Muslims and uh, the Muslim men and the Jewish men were all circumcised. The uncircumcised ones are the Christians. If the Christians hear that we have a commentary like that, they're gonna laugh their heads off. Why will the Christians laugh their heads off? Because they observe the holidays from the morning until the next morning. They say that the holiday begins in the morning and we say, oh, no, 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 the holidays begin in the evening. And then if they see that a great rabbi has written that in the story of creation, the day's finished in the morning, they'll say, you know, the Jews have been uh, pull, trying to pull a fast one on us. They're uh, agreeing with our understanding of what a day is. And even though all these, uh, all of these thoughts went through my mind, va'etapak. I controlled myself. I didn't tear up the commentary, but avur kavoda Shabbat, in order to, for the sake of the honor of the Sabbath. But Ador Neder, still I vowed that after Shabbat concluded, I would not sleep until I would write a long letter proving when a Torah day begins, and thus I would remove a stumbling block and a snare. For all Israel, Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees and Sadducees are, of course, groups that uh, existed uh, 1,200 years before Ibn Ezra. But when he says Pharisees and Sadducees, he means Rabbinites and Karaites. Uh, the Karaite Jews were the ones who didn't accept the authority of uh, rabbinic Judaism. But Ibn Ezra knows a lot about the Karaites, and he knows that all of the Karaites observe Shabbat from the evening until the next evening. They don't observe it from morning to morning. And everybody knows that. Uh, so the, I told you there is a scholarly theory that there was a tiny group of Jews in Cyprus uh, who, who, didn't, uh, uh, who, who didn't behave this way. Uh, but, but even I was just saying, you know, 
what's going on that some rabbi here is writing an interpretation here and he's claiming that it's the shot and it undermines what all Jews are doing, both the rabbinites and the Karaites. They all know that the story of the creation, what God created on each day was written solely so that those who observe Shabbat would know how to observe the Shabbat. This is even, as far as I'm concerned, this is even Ezra's strongest argument, which is that the first chapter of Genesis is there leading up to the words by and then the creation was finished and then there was the Shabbat and it's an introduction to Shabbat. That's what, uh, what it is. And if Rashbam claims that Shabbat should be observed from evening to evening, then it doesn't make much sense for the Torah to say that the days of creation of God finished in the morning. That's a strong argument, but uh, I, I still think that Rashbam is offering a very good interpretation of the words. They are to rest, even Ezra says, in the same way that God rested according to the count of the days of the week. And so it wouldn't make sense to have a different count. Uh, and then even Ezra finishes off with a curse uh, on I guess on me for teaching what Rashbam said on the subject. He writes, may God avenge the vengeance of Shabbat from anyone who believes this difficult interpretation. If anyone reads it out loud, may his tongue cleave to the roof of his mouth. A scribe who writes this interpretation in a Torah commentary, may his arm wither and his eye dim. And presumably Art Scroll saw this uh, curse of Ibn Ezra and decided that they had to censor Rashbam's, uh, uh, Rashbam's commentary. Uh, and then Ibn Ezra presents to us the poem that was uh, the letter. Here is the letter that Shabbat wrote to me. And uh, curiously, Shabbat writes poetry using the kind of meter that Ibn Ezra uses when he writes his poetry. Uh, do I have enough time to get? No, I'm not going to get into details of how you can see how the the, the style, of the, the the Hebrew style here is preserving a a, a way of mixing uh, shvaim and other vowels together. A really complicated way of writing poetry that even Ezra liked to use and that other Svardim like to use. Dona shivan lavrat. Okay, uh, some other time, maybe we'll go into the details of uh, the, the, this Sephardic beat of poetry. So this is Shabbat writing to him. Uh, translating poetry is very difficult. I didn't translate this whole, uh, th this whole poem. I, I'm going to put these texts on the, uh, on the Torah in Motion website after the class. If anybody wants to read the, uh, this poem, uh, in its entirety, you can, but I did translate the end of the poem here, the last four lines of the poem. This is the part that got Ibn Ezra uh, upset. Shabbat said to him, I protected you all the days because you carefully observed me from the days of your youth. This line became famous uh, in the, uh, as a line of uh, Ahad Ha'am, Asher Ginsburg, uh, is uh, famous for saying, Yoter mi she Yisrael shamru et ha-shabbat, ha-shabbat shamra et Yisrael, more than Jews, uh, Kept Shabbat, Shabbat kept the Jews, uh, kept the Jews alive, and that's uh, so. Uh, uh, Ha'am was actually just using this line here of uh, of Ibn Ezra. I guarded you all these days because you carefully observed me uh, from the days of your youth. But then it says, In your old age, a fault has been found in you, for books were brought into your house. And there it says, or actually, it implies that uh, Friday night is not uh, Shabbat. Ha'abarim. 
How do you remain silent and not bow to compile letters of truth and send them in all directions? So this is the introduction to Ibn Ezra's Yerd Shabbat, and then he has a very long, complicated book in which he tries to prove that uh, the, the day, a biblical day has to begin in the evening and could not begin in the morning. And Ibn Ezra was a, uh, uh, an excellent Bible commentator. He was also an excellent astronomer and also an excellent astrologer. And uh, there's a whole bunch of astronomy and astrology mixed into this book. Um, I read it, the, the entire book of the Gerda Shabbat. It, it didn't convince me, but I might be biased uh, because of my uh, uh, because of, uh, of my special relationship with Rushbaum's uh, with Rushbaum's commentary here. So here we have a perfect example: one great rabbi, uh, one great Talmudist rabbi, who feels perfectly capable of offering a shot interpretation of the text that he must have realized was going to fly in the face of Jewish practice. And it's possible that he on purpose put into his commentary on, uh, on verse 14, Bayulo total that, that a halachic day goes from uh, evening until evening, so you shouldn't suspect him of, uh, uh, of uh, having a heterodox view on the subject. He doesn't have a heterodox view on this legal question, but he does have a heterodox form of interpretation. And Ibn Ezra, although Ibn Ezra also loves Pshat, and we will see examples in future weeks of Ibn Ezra offering Pshat, even when there's a little bit of tension between Pshat and Halakha, Ibn Ezra says, Ad Khan, that, that, this is a, the limit. You, you can't go farther than this. Um, just to finish off, you know, I said in the beginning, well, if we don't know from the first chapter of Genesis that a halachic day begins in, uh, in the evening, where do we know it from? And I paraphrase these verses for you. We can read these verses here. Mark, the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a Sabbath of complete rest for you. And you shall practice self-denial on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, you shall observe this your Sabbath or about Pesach, in the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread. You eat matzah from the 14th day of the month at evening until the 21st day of the month at evening. Okay, that seems to clinch it, that the day goes from the evening to the evening, but look at the dates that are there. Let's, let's think about that second text first. When do you eat Matzah, it says that you eat matzah from the 14th day of the month at evening. But when do we eat matzah? We don't start eating matzah until, but we're not allowed to eat matzah until it's dark outside. And then what's the date when, when we eat matzah at the Seder? It's the 15th of the month. Why does it say here? From the 14th day of the month at evening, when actually you're not allowed to, the halacha says you're not allowed to eat matzah on the 14th day of the month. And, but it seems that this text is referring to that night, uh, this year, uh, the, the first Seder, um, for those of us in Israel, the only Seder was on Saturday night. You're not allowed to eat, you were not allowed to eat matzah during the day on Saturday, only on Saturday night. And on Saturday night, we, uh, Halacha teaches us to call that the 15th day of the month. So why does the Torah call that the 14th day of the month? And the same problem with Yom, with, uh, with Yom Kippur. Why does it say that you, you, you practice self-denial on the ninth day of the month at evening? At least about that, there is a Midrash that the rabbis try to solve, uh, to, to solve that problem. And they say, well, if you eat a lot on the ninth of uh, the on the ninth of Tishrei, on the ninth day of the month, then uh, it's considered as if you fasted like for, for two days. Uh, but it, on the simple level here, 
it seems that the Torah is calling that evening, it, it's calling it the ninth of the month, and it's calling the evening of the Seder, it's calling it the 14th day of the month instead of calling it the 15th day of the month. And in fact, you can find this in narratives also. I, I, I apologize for picking such an unpleasant uh, narrative to, uh, to illustrate this, uh, this point. Uh, but this is the, the story that makes uh, the definition of the day most clear. It's the story of Lot's daughters seducing him one at a time, one night after another. So it says, Balailahu, that night, they made their father drink wine and the older one went and she slept with her father and he did not know when she lay down or when she rose up. Nimachorat, the next day. What does the next day mean? It means, it implies that when that night finished and then they woke up in the morning and the sun had risen, it's a new day. It's machar, it's the next day. It's not the same day anymore. And so what does the older daughter say to her younger sister uh, in the morning? She says to him, see, I lay with father last night. Let's make him drink wine tonight. That was last night. It's not the same day. That's the, you know, the understanding in the, in the narrative is that the day switches in the morning and that that night they also made their father. It's, 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 it, it, so the, the, this text seems to imply that there is this understanding uh, that Rashbam identifies in Genesis chapter one. It appears in many biblical texts, at least when it comes to the counting of the days and to the way people talk about the days. And this led Rabbi Moshe Davi Kasuto in his commentary on Genesis to say, uh, I'm just making much shorter uh, what Kasuda wrote on the subject here. He wrote, there, throughout the Bible, there obtains only one system of computing time. The day is considered to begin in the morning. But in regard to the festivals and the appointed times, the Torah ordains that they should also be observed on the night of the preceding day. He says it's a special rule about Yom Tov. It's a special rule about... Uh, 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 about holy days that the celebration begins in the previous evening, but he argues that Rashbam's understanding of when the day finishes in Genesis chapter one actually can be seen to be the case throughout the Bible. Okay, it is... Uh, 10 to or a little la later than that. And uh, shall we open up the chat? And uh, uh, would you like me to feed you the questions? I think you. Sure, Rabbi Kelman, go for if, it. If I may, I, I, I usually do that. I just want, if you can comment before we get the question, why would, I mean, why would the Torah be so ambiguous? Like, in other words, the Torah is <laughs> doing this on purpose to confuse us. I mean, you know, I, I <laughs> in other words, I have a little bit of a theory, but I, I'm curious. In other words, that's great. This is all very beautiful and really, you know, thank you. But why can't the Torah speak like, you know, so we can understand? I mean, that's a, a common problem in a thousand places, but. I think, I, I, I agree. I do not have a good answer to that, Rabbi Kelvin. Do you have a good answer to that? Uh, I, yeah, I once thought, I have to really check what I thought, but I think it has to do a little bit the distinction between how we count time in the temple and how we count time outside of the temple. And, and I think night and day, you know, night operates represents fear and, and uh, uncertainty and day represents hope. And I think the Torah wants to tell us they're different. Like Abraham Dovin's, you know, you know, Shachrit, he doesn't have a Mariv. If Abraham's like the first thing to Dovin would be the morning, they each represent different ideas. And I think the Torah wants to present days and, and time periods. And that's, you know, Shimshon for all Hershey's, you know, beautiful explanation that in the temple, the day begins in the morning because it's all about light then. But in outside the temple where we live, the day begins at night and our role in life is to bring light to the darkness. But the day mm -hmm. begins dark and we bring it in. But in the temple, it's the exact opposite because it's, it's God's place. So I right. think perhaps the Torah wants to play with this, but it's just, you know, <laughs> the Torah could have been a lot clearer. <laughs> it could have been. The only other thing that I would say on the subject is that not a lot went on at night in antiquity. Um, that 
there, there weren't lights and people went to sleep. And, and, and so it, what seems like a big difference might not be such a gigantic difference. Okay. All right. Let, let's try to get some of the questions. I'll just mention sure. some comments. You can comment them after the question. Just uh, some pointing out that Mendelssohn was the one who was uh, brought the rush bomb to popularity. I don't know if that's true. You we can comment on that afterwards. And um, and then pointing to David Eisen, pointing out that many of the to vote um, when it's night says or the Yom the Yom Hamishit to point out that it's the night of the you know the Thursday Wednesday night Thursday as opposed to Thursday day. Okay. Um, Somebody just asking, um, okay, when lighting candles for the second day of Yontif, can you prepare food for that second day right after candle lighting? Yeah, right, yes, yeah, or the, for the next morning. You know, the night, I, I assume, you have to prepare at night if you have to prepare. That's the beginning. Right. Ha Halakhically, everybody agrees that they start at night. This is just right. a discussion. Right. This is just what it means for in the sure. Torah. How will we do according to Halakha? Right, for, right. Sure. for sure, for sure. That, which isn't so, but uh, okay. Um, Rashbam, Lauren kept pointing out, Rashbam spells it out because he wants to show, I guess, because he, he's a, um, attacking Rashi. It's also- Right, an, for uh, sure. I agree 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. For Rashbam, was the first day different than from day two onwards, or the days different from before the sun and moon were created? You know, I've often thought about that question. There doesn't seem to be any evidence uh, that- uh, that there was any difference in his mind between the first day and the fifth day. Uh, okay. if, if there was, he didn't make that clear. Okay, uh, I want to know is even as you're saying the day, I'm not sure what you're referring to. This is literally true or it's explicitly just a poetic framing. I assume we're talking about his Egeret, which uh, were yes. I mean, yes. is not literally true and as Dr. Lakshan already pointed out. If the, yeah. that's not what you meant, you can, can speak up or write out and we'll get back to it. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, David Eisen pointing out that even Ezra's time spent in England, so he's commentary to the plague of darkness, where he compares it to <laughs> yes. fog, yes. the thickness of darkness. <laughs> Irene Lancaster, who I know has done a lot of work on even Ezra and who lives in England, right. um, mm -hmm. and there wasn't any fog in England in those days, okay? This, you know, <laughs> it was probably sea mist. Incidentally, even Ezra states in his introduction to the Torah, written well before this work, that he will never respect anybody, only God. Now, that's a common people write, I we respect no person. That's a, a pasuk in, in Chumash, that uh, the Dayan, the lo, lo, lo tagur mifnaish, don't respect anybody, just God, yes. yes. Um, a whole machloket here about the clouds in London, the fog in London. I don't know. Okay, even as refers to the clouds rolling in from the Atlantic, is that London? Okay, so a whole text. Okay, um, there's a text here, Rabbi. Um, that's the Atlantic. So I don't know if that's in London or what. If you know, that's the text from Ibn Ezra, Shmot Perak Yud. Right. Maybe you want to fill us in with that? Okay. Um, when did we lunarize our calendar? I guess from the beginning. Um, and Shmot Yud Beit, HaChodesh Yuselechem Rosh Chodashim. No, right. uh, Gerald, if you want to, if I, I think that's what you mean. Okay. Ibn Ezra was in Kent. Okay. Um, a whole thing uh, rolling in from the Atlantic. Okay. Uh, this I don't know. I had a check where Ibn Ezra lived. Okay, when did he come to, to London, Ibn Ezra? Uh, in, in the last years of his life. I mean, he traveled a lot. Ibn Ezra was a real, uh, yeah, real traveler. Yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. Um, Lord's daughters, next day equal next light. Not a unit of full day and night. I don't fully understand. Okay, it's possible. It's possible to say that, but there are so many, uh, exactly, the word machar, uh, it appears often in the Bible. That's just one of uh, of many examples, and it means like the the next morning. Uh, it, it doesn't mean when people said machar when they said tomorrow, they didn't mean that uh, tomorrow is uh, the time that's going to be getting here in fifteen minutes when the sun sets. Uh, okay. All right, Lauren Kaplan just pointing out that Kasuto's point, I think, correct. Kasuto is really pointing out what this is simple shot in the Chumash. Um, okay, is it possible there are, uh, so somebody wants to know, Janet wants to know, um, how do the Bible critics deal with this? You know, uh, we spoke a little bit about Bill Krugis in one of your previous like series. You know, do they, is this an issue they, they touch upon at all? But okay. Uh, the, there isn't, you know, there's, 
it's really interesting to see that there is not agreement among the Bible critics about what the uh, original uh, calendar of the uh, of the Israelites looked like. Uh, there, there are theories all over the place, and so so they don't. There isn't one uh, uh, consensus feeling on the subject. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. If anybody has any questions, you can can speak up. But just a reminder before you do so, we're going to take a, sh a short break. And at 12.15 or 7.15 in Israel, uh, Yom uh, Rivi'i or Yom Hamishi, perhaps. If you know, <laughs> Lori Novik will start her four-part series on women and Kriyat HaTorah. Look at, 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 at the sources. Again, uh, it's always nice, you know, people yell and scream and politicize things. So we're going to take a... a uh, a look, what do, this, what do our sources say about women and Korea at Torah? So today's part one, Lori's a uh, al She's a, a wonderful teacher. She's been teaching also for us for quite a bit. So if you haven't heard her, I invite you after your cup of, 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 of coffee and a walk in the snow here in Toronto, you take, uh, the snow is melting a little already, I see. Um, then uh, we come back at 12.15. That'll be in 15 minutes, the first of a four part series. And then this evening, of course, our regular series, Moshe Sokolov, Dr. Sokolov, the Haftor of the Week, and tomorrow morning, Shuli Mishkin continuing the second part of her series on the Israel, or always, always was fascinating, the modern state, and tomorrow night, Rabbi Nadi Helfgott of Teaneck, New Jersey, will be giving the Parsha at Shavu Shir at 8.30, and I'll be giving the Pirkei Avot Shir at 9.30 a.m. on Friday morning. So we look forward to seeing you the rest of the week. If anybody has any questions or extra comments before we let Dr. Lakshin go, um, now's the time to speak up. Um, what's the actual time you have to wait between slaughtering the mother and the cow would be, depending, be 15 minutes now, like in Halakha. That's it, right. It, the the That's Halakha right. takes the Yom Echad, and really, I think your point that since that Pasuk is by the Beit Hamikdash. You could very easily make an argument that the there would be the day starting in the morning, but that's not what the halacha. Does. That's not what the halacha did. That's right. Correct. Okay, uh, everybody. Thank you very much. A pleasure to see you. We look forward to seeing you next week. Wonderful uh, seeing you all. The week. That you came. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lakshin, and uh, enjoy the weather in Yerushalayim. Enjoy the going wherever you want and the freedom that uh, yes. please God we should all have soon. Emir Sashem by dear. You know, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, okay. Be well, we'll see you. We'll start in about uh, a about 13 minute break and then we'll get started. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.